The relationship between the United States and China stands as one of the world's most pivotal and intricate diplomatic connections. Since 1972, these two superpowers have navigated through periods of tensions, escalations, and cooperation. They have grappled with issues spanning trade, national security, human rights, climate change, and the status of Taiwan. As the world closely monitors the American elections, speculation is rife regarding the potential return of Donald Trump to the White House or the continuation of Joe Biden's administration for another four years. However, paramount among these concerns is the nature and depth of engagement between the United States and China, with ramifications that extend across the global economy and security landscape. Will both nations redouble their efforts to stabilize their bilateral ties and avert further escalation? And to what extent Will the United States and China inevitably reach a point of serious deadlock, irrespective of who occupies the White House? Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of His Excellency, Dr. Sultan Naimi, Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, we are delighted to welcome you all at this distinguished evening. I'm Abed Zaabi, Sector Director for Strategic Studies and Research, and I'm honored to be moderating this lecture, which is actually more as a conversation than a lecture. In an era defined by geopolitical complexities and shifting power dynamics, few topics are as relevant as the evolving relationship between US and China. To shed some light on this significant relations and dynamics, we are privileged to hear from Professor Kishore Mahbubani, who is a distinguished fellow at Asia Research Institute at the National University in Singapore, as he will explore the prospects for U.S.-China relations following the 2024 U.S. election. Professor Mahbubani is a former Singapore diplomat who has dedicated five decades of his life to public service. He has held positions in several globally significant committees. He was the founding chairman of the nominating committee of the Lee Kuan Yew World Cities Prize. From 2009 to 2019, he has participated in the annual meetings of the World Economic Forum in Davos 20 times while also serving in several uh, World Economic Forum committees. Professor Mahubani published nine books, among them his latest books, Has China Won? and The Asian 21st Century, which were released in 2020 and uh, 2022. Before we move to Professor Mahubani, the format of our conversation will be as at the beginning, I will pose some question of my own, and then I will open the floor for the audience to participate or in, in order to, uh, to ask questions or uh, have comments. Professor, firstly, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us tonight. I want to start our <coughs> conversation by asking the following. With the upcoming U.S. election, in 20, by the end of this year. Are we expected to witness a real potential change in the US foreign policy towards China? Isn't it a state policy or it's a policy related to, to, to the president himself? Hmm. Well, the answer I'm gonna give you is a very paradoxical one. On the one hand, the outcome of the elections could change nothing. <laughs> On the other hand, it could change everything. So why, why do I give this paradoxical answer? Because it's very, very clear that even though the United States, as we all know today, is a deeply divided society where Americans cannot agree on anything, there's only one thing they agree on, it's time to stop China. So regardless of who's the president, the mission to stop China will continue. And that policy has become deeply embedded in both the establishment, the society, you know, and everyone seems to agree that this is the time for United States to stop China. But at the same time, the reason why I say it could change everything is that if Trump wins, which is certainly possible, 
uh, I think you can never tell what Trump is going to do. <laughs> he could go to either extreme, right? And certainly, he'll carry on the contest against China. There's no question about that at all. But how? And, and he could make things a lot worse, much, much worse. So therefore, we, we have to prepare ourselves for all possibilities. Certainly, if you come from uh, small states like UAE or Singapore, as, as I do, you have to recognize that we, whether we like it or not, are now witnessing the largest geopolitical contest ever seen in human history. And I say the largest geopolitical contest because we've never had powers of the size and scale of the United States today and China going head to head. And because this is such an immense geopolitical contest, it will rock the world and it will affect all of us, no matter what we do, no matter where we live. And that's why we need to uh, understand this. And that's why I think it's very timely that you're having this dialogue here in UAE now. Uh, so you said that all the Americans agree on one thing, which is like to stop China. So does that mean like the US has like a strategy or a grand stra strategy to stop mm. China? Or it's like more related to mm. each president and his way of dealing mm. with China? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you, you used the words grand strategy. Because uh, when I was writing my book, uh, Has China Won? I had the privilege of uh, having a very long one-on-one -on -one lunch with, with someone who was then clearly America's greatest living strategic thinker, Henry Kissinger. It was a long lunch, hour and a half, two hours. And at the end of the lunch, when I went back, I asked myself, what, what was the message that Henry Kissinger was trying to give to me at this one-on-one -on -one lunch? And it became clear to me, after I, after I reflected on my conversation with him, that the message he was telling me was that the biggest strategic mistake that the United States is making in this contest against China is that it has launched this contest without a strategy. I thought, gosh, that's a very profound thing to say. So I had to write to him. I wrote to Henry Kissinger and I said, Dear Henry, uh, we, thank you for the lunch. Do you mind if I cite you saying this in my book? And fortunately, he gave me his permission. So the fact that someone as senior and as well informed as Henry Kissinger can say that there's no strategy is a very important point. And it's also confirmed by the evidence, right? It, while we know for sure that the United States will carry out actions in one way or another against China, it's not clear what the goal is. I mean, is the goal to stop China's economic development? It cannot be done. Is the goal to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party? It cannot be done. Is the goal to successfully contain and isolate China like the way the United States successfully isolated and contained the Soviet Union? It can't be done. So if it's not clear what the goals are, People are asking, you've launched this contest. What is your end game? What will constitute a victory for you? And as you know, that has never been spelled out by anybody. Except once, I think, uh, President Joe Biden in passing mentioned, saying the Chinese aim to become number one. And he said, it ain't going to happen on my watch. So basically what he's saying, I will not allow Chinese economy to overtake the US economy while I'm still president. So clearly, if you look at all the actions that have been taken, the tariffs, the, the chip war, they're all designed in one way or another to slow down the Chinese economic growth. Because I think the United States has made, in some ways, a rational calculation that if and when the Chinese economy becomes number one, 
everything changes. And the very privileged position that the United States has had for, by the way, 130, 140 years uh, as the number one power in the world, that can change. And, and, and here I want to emphasize that I do believe, and this is also a result of my conversation with uh, Henry Kissinger, that there is a wiser strategy for the United States. Instead of trying to stop China, the United States should try to work with China to create a world which has enough space for two big powers. Mm -hmm. And that was also, by the way, a strategy that the former President Bill Clinton suggested in a speech that he gave in Yale in 2003. And in my book, Has China Won? I, I, I cite the speech he gave where he said, Bill Clinton said, if the US is going to be number one forever, then we can keep on doing what we are doing. But he added a but. He said, but if we can conceive of a world where we are no longer number one, then surely it's in, it's in the United States' interest to build multilateral institutions, multilateral processes, multilateral rules, multilateral norms that will in one way or another constrain China. And that would be a wiser strategy. So those of us who are friends of the US and friends of China should therefore be advocating to both of them, why don't you adopt a wiser strategy that would be better for both of you and better for us, instead of this rather destructive zero-sum game that is being played out now? Uh, this leads me to, to, to two questions, actually. Like the mm. first one, you, you mentioned like uh, China, they are trying to prevent China from being number one. Mm. How do you define number one in this world? Like, are we talking economically or like politically? Or what exactly? Mm. And does China really want to be number one in this world? That's actually a very good question. Mm -hmm. And the, the first definition of being number one in the world is definitely the economic dimension. Because if you have the largest economy that gives you a lot of weight. But I want to emphasize that what I, what I haven't mentioned so far is the complexity of the US-China contest. And, and it's, it's in, in some ways it's hinted in your question, it's a multi-dimensional contest. It's being played out in economics, in the military dimension, in the political dimension, and in what uh, Joseph Nye calls a soft power dimension. So it is actually conceivable for the United States to become, in nominal GDP terms, the number two power, but yet remain the number one most influential power in the world. It can do that. I mean, if it does adopt a wise strategy. So for example, I can tell you the, the most powerful weapon the United States has in the world is not its aircraft carriers, is not its F-35 jets, it's the US dollar. Because the power of the US dollar means that you can impose sanctions, right? And you can take away $300 billion from Russia. Okay? You can do that. So, uh, so there are ways and means for the United States to remain the most influential power in the world, even if its nominal GDP becomes number two. And in response to your specific question, does China want to become number one? The answer is yes and no. Why do I say yes and no? Yes, because they want to have the world's largest economy. Because they know at the end of the day, what will protect China is having the largest economy in the world. But at the same time, the Chinese don't have the same ambition that the United States does to run the world. The United States, as you know, is present in all corners of the world, intervening in this issue, intervening in that issue, taking care of this problem, taking care of that problem. The Chinese view is that we are 1.4 billion people, we have enough problems at home, we will take care of our problems, the world will take care of itself. So in that sense, I don't think the Chinese have a desire to step into the shoes of the United States in terms of its global uh, uh, involvement in various issues. So the, in that sense, I think 
It is actually possible, therefore, and I, yeah, the reason I'm making these suggestions is that I'm looking for ways and means of creating a world where United States and China can live together in peace without having going in loggerheads with each other. Uh, so you just said like the United States doesn't have any strategy regarding China. Let's go to the other side. How about the Chinese? Do they have a grand strategy in dealing with the U.S.? Well, the, 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 uh, as the weaker party, uh, if they didn't have a strategy, they'd be in deep trouble. <laughs> I think out of necessity, they have to have a strategy. And they do have one. So, for example, uh, they ask themselves the obvious question. Why did the United States successfully defeat the Soviet Union? Why? And they, they must say, the one country that has studied the collapse of the Soviet Union more carefully than any country in the world is China, because China knows that the dream of the United States is to make China the second Soviet Union that collapses. So how does China prevent a collapse? First point. The Soviet Union didn't collapse because of external pressures. It collapsed because of internal weaknesses. And so China realizes, to make sure I survive, I must have a very strong dynamic economy and a strong dynamic society. And by the way, you know, there was a very famous American thinker George Kennan, who said way back in 1949, very presently he said, at the end of the day, the outcome of the contest between United States and Soviet Union will depend on not on our weapons and you know troops and all that. It will depend on which society has got greater spiritual vibrancy inside, stronger. And so United States society was far more dynamic than Soviet Union society. United States thrive, Soviet Union collapse. So the Chinese know that the first priority is to make sure your economy is strong and your society is strong, which is why they're massively educating their people and growing their economy so that they don't become a second Soviet Union. The second thing that the Chinese learned from the collapse of the Soviet Union was that the United States succeeded because it managed to get a lot of the neighbors of the Soviet Union to join the containment policy everywhere. Western Europe, Japan, South Korea, right? Both ends of the Soviet Union. So what did the Chinese do? The Chinese launched a preemptive strike against a containment policy by making sure that its neighbors dependent on the Chinese economy. I'll give you a simple example. You know, Singapore is part of Southeast Asia, and we are part of an organization called ASEAN. And ASEAN started as a pro-American organization, okay? In fact, when ASEAN was created on August 8, 1967, both the Soviet Union and China denounced the creation of ASEAN as a pro-American organization. Right? And it's true. ASEAN was pro-American, pro-Western. And what was stunning was that even though ASEAN was pro-American, pro-Western, and we had longer dialogues with United States, European Union, Australia, Japan, everybody, none of our Western friends proposed a free trade agreement to ASEAN. The first country to propose a free trade agreement to ASEAN was China in 2001. And the impact of that China-ASEAN agreement was phenomenal. Because in the year 2000, and the, that's when, the, when China proposed the free trade agreement, ASEAN's trade with the United States was $135 billion, And our trade with China was only $40 billion. So US trade was, you know, more than three and a half times what uh, uh, China's trade with ASEAN was. But as a result of the free trade agreement, by 2022, 
Even though ASEAN's trade with the uh, United States has gone from 135 to 450, 500 billion, an increase of over three times, China's trade with ASEAN went from 40 billion to 975 billion dollars, almost a trillion dollars. The world's largest trading relationship in 2022. So that was, that was, then there's no way ASEAN can join a containment policy against its largest trading partner, right? It's crazy. So that's how, that, that's part of the Chinese strategy. And I, I mentioned a third one very quickly. You take the Belt and Road Initiative that the China has launched, building infrastructure in all corners of the world. What does that mean? Every country in the world says, oh, this infrastructure is good. I need Chinese fast trains, I need Chinese highways. And then would you join a containment policy? You won't. So that, it shows you that they have systematically worked out a grand strategy. But at the same time, I can tell you that the Chinese also have a lot of respect for the United States. They understand that United States as a power is a remarkable power. And so their challenge is, even with all this strategy, they cannot underestimate what the United States can eventually do. Uh, professor, uh, you have mentioned before, like, and uh, even we were having a discussion like earlier today, that the U.S. has 10 years to counter the rise of China. Hmm. Why specifically 10 years? Well, I think um, it's all a matter of mathematics. Mm -hmm. And if the Chinese economy keeps growing, right, at 5% a year over 10 years, and, you know, you, 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 I don't have the maths off the top of my head. Even if it doesn't overtake, it comes very, very close. Mm -hmm. And the bigger China gets, the harder it is to stop it. And it's quite clear that the Chinese have been quite ingenious in creating a long-term manufacturing strategy for China. And that manufacturing capability of China is now indispensable to the rest of the world. I mean, all of you, if you open your kitchen cupboards or whatever it is, take out the products. See how many of the components in any of the products came from China. Just check. You'll be amazed. This is not by accident. China wants to create deep dependence on China's manufacturing sector. And you know, incidentally, uh, even five, ten years ago, five years ago, if you had asked anybody, could China ever join the competition in for cars? You would say, no way, the Germans are so far ahead, Japanese are so far ahead, Koreans are far ahead, even the Americans are far ahead. But you know what, today, the Chinese have started from scratch, created an electric vehicle EV industry that is now frightening the pants of all car makers all over the world. Because you, the Chinese manufacturing ecosystem on EVs is so amazing, right? And even Elon Musk at first dismissed it now he wouldn't dare to dismiss it. But did this EV uh, challenge from China emerge by accident? No. It is part of the long-term strategy, right? And five years from now, all over the world, you see Chinese EVs. So as the world transforms and becomes more dependent on China, it narrows the options for the United States. I mean, quite naturally. Which is why there is in Washington, D.C., a very strong sense of urgency. And by the way, you know, if you look at what some of the people who, uh, some of the Americans, I could give you names, uh, Robert Lighthizer, Matt Pottinger, they'll be coming back to advise uh, Trump. They, they are the ones who are saying, hurry up, hurry up, we've got to act fast. So the sense of urgency in Washington, D.C. is very real. And so, 
this leads me to, to the next question, like what are the measures that the U.S. could take in, in order to counter the rise of China? Like, uh, mm -hmm. and is this uh, like uh, measures going to differ from Biden to Trump? Mm. Well, I think the best answer to your question, what should the United States do, was given by um, George Cannon in the remark I quoted earlier in 1949, where he said at the end of the day, the outcome of the contest will depend on which country's domestic society is stronger. And here, the, the challenge for the United States today, sadly, is that it has become a deeply divided society, right? And in my book, as you know, has China won in chapter seven, I provide lots of empirical data, but taken from American scholars, by the way, you know, people like Paul Volcker, former head of the Fed, uh, Joe Stiglitz, the Nobel laureate, or Martin Wolf of Financial Times, they've all given data to show how the United States has essentially become a plutocracy. What is a plutocracy? A plutocracy is a society where public policy decisions are made not to benefit the majority at the bottom, but the top 1%, 2%. That's what America... And by the way, this, whatever I'm saying is not original from me. American scholars have saying all this. I'm just repeating what American scholars are saying. And the reason why it looks as though Trump is going to get elected is that the bottom 50% in America, the data shows this, haven't seen an improvement in their standard of living for 30, 40 years. In fact, the American middle class has diminished, you know, significantly. So therefore, if the United States wants to win the contest against China, it should rebuild the strength of its domestic society. That should be its priority. Because at the end of the day, you, you know, like in any uh, athletic contests, right? You're better off trying to win by running faster rather than trying to kneecap your opponent. And that should be the best thing that United States can do. So, but but re changing United States society and taking care of plutocracy is going to be a major challenge. And and that that is what that would be that has to be the answer of the United States. That's very informative. Uh, let's talk about the elections and uh, the U.S. elections. And before we like uh, ask about that, we always like when we discuss the upcoming U.S. elections, we only talk about either Biden or Trump. Is it really like the case that the U.S. most dominant parties lack other options mm -hmm. other than Biden or Trump? Yeah. Well, you're you're, you're absolutely right. It's it's quite puzzling because in terms of human talent. Mm -hmm. No society can beat the United States, frankly. Because, you know, the United States' biggest strength is that it attracts the best brains, not just from 330 million people within the United States, it attracts the best brains from 8 billion people in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And the United States is the only country, I think, where uh, its largest corporation, corporations like Google is run by someone born in India, Sundar Pichai. Uh, Microsoft is run by Satya Nadella, born in India. So, you know, that's quite remarkable. So the, if, if there is no other society that can match the talent of the United States. And frankly, I, I was a visiting fellow at uh, UPenn uh, in March, two months ago, and three months ago. And um, when you go to American universities, the quality of mind of the researchers is dazzling, dazzling. You know, you meet people and you sort of, you sit there with great awe and you wonder, my God, it's amazing research these people are doing. And yet, despite the fact that the United States has the best talent laboratories in the world, it produces two candidates like Trump and Biden. <laughs> I mean, Biden, by the way, is a very nice guy. Uh, he would have been a great president 20 years ago, you know, clearly. Mm -hmm. But now, at his age, it's going to be a challenge for him. And I say that, I mean, I personally, if you ask me, 
most of us, and frankly, most of the rest of the world would rather vote for Joe Biden rather than Donald Trump, because Donald Trump would be disruptive, and Joe Biden will not be disruptive. But of course, we, can, we have no choice. We have to accept whoever is the president. And unfortunately, the prospects of Trump being elected uh, seem to be getting stronger, sadly. And so I, I suspect it will be a Trump-Biden election. Mm -hmm. But what the results will be, I would say that uh, one lesson we are learning is that in democratic societies, never predict the results of elections. Until, until three weeks ago, everybody was telling me that Prime Minister Modi would win big time, 350 to 400 seats. What did he get? 240. So you see, elections are very surprising. So I would say, be ready for surprises in the US election, because there are too many factors at play in this contest. Okay. Talking about Trump, uh, given his previous policies, in which he focused like more on reducing overseas commitments, to what extent do you think he may seek to conclude a deal with China? where mm. this deal would involve ensuring that China bears part of the security burdens in the Middle East specific, specifically? I mean, mm. like. Well, I think that's, that's, I think the important thing to tell you about Trump is that anything is possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, for example, I mean, to use another example, let me go switch for one second to uh, Ukraine. Trump could either say, I, I'm gonna go all the way, I'm gonna defeat Putin, then you pump up resources and, you know, go full scale ahead into Ukraine. Oh, he could do the exact opposite. He could say, this war is of no interest to me. Let the Europeans fight in this war. I'm walking away. I want to make, and his, his, his slogan is MAGA. Make America great again. So he's not interested in the Ukraine war. And as you know, for some strange reason, he's got this particular dislike for Ukraine. I don't know why. It's a complicated story. And, and he's also got a strange dislike for the Europeans. Mm -hmm. And I asked an American friend of mine, why, why does he like the European, dislike the Europeans? And my friend gave me a very profound answer. He said all his life, Donald Trump wanted to get accepted by society, especially elite American society. Even though he's very wealthy, he was never accepted. He was an outsider. So when you're an outsider, you develop this psychological, you know, angst and anger. So he has this anger against the American establishment. And in some ways, the Europeans also personify, you know, the old rich, the establishment. <coughs> the Europeans look at him with disdain. So he said, okay. Now I'll teach you who's boss, right? So there is a very complicated relationship within Trump and the Europeans. So, so in, on Ukraine, he could do either thing. And similarly, on China, he could do either way. But I think on China, Donald Trump has bought the, the main thesis that the United States cannot allow China to become number one. So he might possibly make a deal, but I think the Chinese are not counting on it. The Chinese have to get ready for a more aggressive uh, president. But again, having said that, the only thing you must know about Donald Trump is that he can do anything. Because when, when Donald Trump wakes up, actually he cannot predict what he's going to do in the rest of the day. He may change his mind in the course of the day. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. And uh, before we conclude, Professor, please, you have one, one, one minute only. Uh, if you have any final thoughts or insights, only one minute. So. Um, <laughs> in one minute, I can promise you that you will not be bored in the next 10 years. The US-China contest will accelerate and get ready, you'll watch the greatest show in human history. 
Good to know that. <laughs> Thank you. At the end of this uh, truly compelling session and very informative, we would like to thank you, Professor, for offering this uh, very insightful and unique perspectives on this vital topic, the prospects of the U.S.-China relations following the 2024 elections. And we also thank you, our esteemed audience, for your participations. And we look forward to welcoming you all again into our next uh, discussion and lectures. Thank you.